Welcome to our Gerontology Research Group online meeting. Today is Friday, March 24th, 2023. And special thanks to Miles Jacobs, who manages our meetings. I'm kind of busy solving the problems of biological aging these days. And without Miles, we probably wouldn't have as many of these meetings and they definitely would not be as high quality as the one we're gonna to have today. Today, we have an extraordinary innovative speaker, Dr. Michael Levin. And Dr. Levin is Distinguished Professor and Vannevar Bush Chair, Biology Department at Tufts, and Director of the Allen Discovery Center at Tufts. He's also Associate Faculty at Harvard's Dees Institute. In his lab, he studies basic questions of information processing in biology and drives applications in regenerative medicine and synthetic bioengineering. Um, it must have been 20 years ago I read a book, The Body Electric by Becker, and I was just amazed at the opportunity. And now I believe Dr. Levin is going to bring some of that to life for you. So I will hand the floor over to Dr. Michael Levin. Well, thank you so much for the invitation and thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk to you all and share some ideas. Uh, I uh, am not directly working in the field of uh, aging, but uh, I think uh, we have some, some thoughts that are possibly useful uh, for, that, for that set of questions. And so if anybody's interested, uh, this is the website where you can find all the primary papers, the software, the data sets uh, and, and everything else. So I'm going to talk about today is an approach towards what I call a definitive regenerative medicine. I will explain what I mean. And uh, in my view, the, the road to this definitive regenerative medicine uh, contains large components of understanding natural bioelectrical signaling between cells, specifically not just as a physical mechanism, but actually as the medium for the collective intelligence of groups of cells. So what I mean by a definitive regenerative medicine is uh, breaking the uh, unsustainable feedback loop or cycle between this, uh, this, this scheme where we, we try these uh, interventions uh, late in life uh, and uh, to whatever extent we can, uh, whatever, we can, we can push, push forward the, uh, the lifespan, the next set of interventions has to be increasingly more heroic because what you're basically dealing with is a, a continuously sinking ship. And this is uh, unacceptable for, for, for us as patients. It's, it's unsupportable for any society because it exponentially increases the cost of each, each further intervention that has to be done. So something radical has to break this cycle. And if we think about it, um, all of the problems of medicine with the exception of infectious disease. So we're talking about birth defects, traumatic injuries, cancer, aging, degenerative disease, all of this have one important thing in common. They are all problems of information processing in the following sense. If we could control what it is that groups of cells build, that is, if we could convince groups of cells to build particular complex anatomical structures, all of these problems would go away. We could continuously rebuild structures of the body to um, maintain health span, uh, repair injuries, reprogram cancer. All of these things would be, uh, would be uh, resolved if we understood how to get cells to build particular anatomical structures. And so uh, the kind of uh, end game of this, of this whole, whole field, I call something uh, that can be termed as the anatomical compiler. The idea is that someday in the future, we will be able to sit down in front of a computer and draw in terms of uh, the anatomy that you want your plant or animal to have. So, so not molecular pathways, not uh, uh, the underlying biochemical details, but what you actually care about, which is the, 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 the form and function. So you will draw this, this is some sort of anatomical structure like this three-headed flatworm. And uh, if we knew what we were doing, the anatomical compiler would, would convert that anatomical descriptor into a set of stimuli that would get cells to build exactly that. So what we're talking about is complete control over growth and form. This is the, the, the radical uh, solution that we need. Now, note that, that this, kind of, this kind of thing is, is not a 3D printer. The point is not to micromanage uh, where every single cell goes. It's a communications device. And we'll get back to this uh, concept towards the, towards the end of the talk. So, so uh, having, having focused in on this, on this idea that um, 
it is it is the uh, the cooperative action of collectives of cells that build our various organs, either healthy organs or or not. We can then ask this very simple question: Where does the body anatomy come from in the first place? So this is a cross section of a human torso. You see all the amazing. Uh, structures that are here, right? The, everything is the correct size, shape relative to uh, the the, the uh, things next to it, and the correct orientation. So, where is this? Uh, where is this structure set? Where where is this order specified? And there are lots of, of people are are um, kind of intuitively will say, well, it's the genome. It's in the, it's in the DNA. But if we look closer at that claim, we now we now understand we can sequence genomes. Now we know what's in the DNA. The DNA doesn't say anything directly about large scale anatomical parameters. What the DNA specifies is proteins. It specifies the micro level hardware that each individual cell gets to have. And so what we still need to understand is how uh, the actual um, collective activity of these cells with their with the hardware that they have from their genome works together to build the right thing. Uh, that is a, a species-specific target morphology. How do these cells know when to stop? Why do cells sometimes defect from this plan and, uh, and form cancer? We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, how would we induce, if a part of this is missing or damaged, how would we induce these cells to rebuild uh, damaged or aging structures? And as engineers, uh, how far can we push this process? What else can these cells build besides their normal default target morphology? And so I want to uh, kind of start off by thinking about um, what's ne what's necessary to uh, to under to to understand this process. And we've had we've had great advances in genomics and molecular biology and big data and genetics and so on. And so you might think that well this should be solved already. Why uh, why do we not have this anatomical compiler? And I just want to be be very clear that very very fundamental things are still impossible from the perspective of, of, of genetics and molecular biology. So, so this is just one example. So, so here's a baby axolotl. It's a little salamander. Um, baby axolotls have four legs. This is a frog larva or a tadpole, which do, do not have legs. And in my lab, what we can do is we can make frog axolotls, which is an embryo that's part salamander cells, part frog cells. Now, I pose a simple question. Uh, Will frog axolotls have legs or won't they? Now we've got the genome for the axolotl; it's been sequenced. We've got the genome for the frog; it's been sequenced. Can anybody tell me whether frog axolotls are going to have legs or not? And the answer is no. We have no idea. Or even more, more subtle questions like: If they do have legs, are they going to be made entirely of the axolotl cells, or are they in fact going to uh, induce some of the frog cells to participate? And and that's because this th this kind of question is not a question that could be answered at the level of the hardware. This is a collective intelligence question. What are these complex uh, agents going to build, right? And and we are still not very good at understanding the rules of that kind of process. So where we are really is that uh, molecular medicine is very good at uh, understanding which genes and proteins interact with which other genes and proteins, and so we can build nice models like this. Uh, but we are really quite a long way away from the control of large scale structure and function. If you wanted to make rational changes at the system level, it is very hard to know what to do back here, and so. Uh, I, I think where uh, molecular medicine is today is roughly where computer science was in the 40s and 50s. Uh, in the 40s and 50s, if you wanted to program a computer, you had to interact with the hardware. You had to directly rewire it physically. You were always down at that at that at that hardware level, and this is where we are today. So all of the uh, most exciting parts of, uh, of of molecular medicine. So so genome editing, CRISPR, uh, protein engineering, pathway rewiring, all of these things are really down at the biological hardware level. We haven't even really begun to take advantage of what uh, computer science has, has done to give us the information technology revolution, which is to figure out that actually, if your hardware is good enough, and I'm going to argue that biological hardware is definitely good enough, then what you can do is you can communicate with it via a high level interface. You don't have to, uh, this, this is the reason why when you want to change from uh, PowerPoint to uh, to Zoom on your laptop, you don't get out your soldering iron and start rewiring. It's because we have this, this nice interface that allows you access to some of the computational capacities of the system that are reprogrammable. In other words, uh, there uh, could, could, could we take advantage of a higher level uh, of information processing, specifically, and I'm going to define this, this word in a minute, specifically uh, the intelligence of the software of life. And the thing about biology, which is actually not captured today in any of our uh, com computational devices or robotics or anything like that, is this, this amazing multi-scale competency architecture where we're not just a nested doll 
a set of nested dolls structurally where you've got uh, molecular networks and cells and tissues and organs and swarms and so on. But actually each one of these layers has competencies. It solves specific problems in its own space. So we have problem solving in physiological space, in transcriptional space, meaning the space of gene expression, in um, anatomical morphous space, and of course in familiar 3D behavioral space in the case of whole, whole organisms. And uh, and so so we could we could spend hours talking about all these different examples, um, but I just want to highlight a couple of things and then spend most of my time talking about the morphogenetic uh, problem solving. So just to give you uh, an example of of some of the, some of the amazing plasticity of life, this is what we've done here is we've made a tadpole. So so here's the mouth, here are the nostrils, the brain, the gut, the tail. And what you'll notice is something very strange about this tadpole. There aren't any eyes where the eye should be. But what we've done is we've placed some eye cells on its tail. Now. These cells they have no problem uh, forming a, a perfect eye, even though they're sitting next to muscle instead of next to the brain. They then put out a single optic nerve, which crawls out. It synapses on the spinal cord right here. Then it stops. It does not go to the brain. It sort of uh, ends on the spinal cord. And these animals, as we found from building a machine that automates the, the um, training and testing of these guys on visual cues, these animals can see quite well. They see perfectly well out of this eye. And so what you see here is this amazing plasticity where this brain that expected visual input from these two locations for millions of years, this is, this is the architecture, in one generation, no uh, adaptation, specific adaptation needed. Uh, the fact that this the sensory motor uh, architecture is, is now completely different, no problem. They're, they're able to incorporate that into their behavioral re repertoire. So we have so so it's 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 clear that that there are these these interesting um uh, uh, capabilities of, 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 of these kinds of biological systems to adapt to novel circumstances. And this is what we're going to hijack. The, these are the kinds of things we're going to hijack for a kind of uh, a really, really radical regenerative medicine. Um, what I want to spend some time on now is to introduce you to, uh, to, this, to this little little critter, which I think in many ways, this, this model system has the answer to many of the big questions of, of life, not only medicine, but, but beyond. This is a planarian flatworm. So these are not simple organisms like earthworms. These are similar to our direct ancestor. They have true bilateral symmetry. They have a true centralized brain. They have lots of organs, lots of different cell types, all the same neurotransmitters that you and I have. And they have a number of amazing properties. The first is uh, regeneration. So you can cut them into pieces. The record is something like 275 pieces. Uh, it doesn't matter how you cut them, what the plane of section is, you can cut them any way you want. Each piece regenerates a perfect worm. It grows exactly what's needed, no more, no less. It gives you uh, a perfect, perfect worm. Um, they're very cancer resistant. It's not that they can't get cancer, but they're, they're extremely resistant. And um, they're immortal. This is maybe the part that's the most interesting to all of you. Uh, there is no such thing as an old planarian. Uh, the individual cells senesce and drop off, but they get regenerated. This, uh, this, this, uh, this animal regenerates um, continuously. And so, so uh, the animals uh, that are in my lab now are in direct physical continuity to worms that were here half a billion years ago. These are literally them. Um, they, just, they just sort of continue. And uh, they're smart. You can train them. I'll, I'll talk about that momentarily. And they've got this interesting property. So uh, they've got an incredibly messy genome. Why? Because most of us uh, reproduce sexually, which means that when you reproduce, your children do not inherit the somatic mutations that happened in your body during your lifetime. But in planaria, the way they typically reproduce is they tear themselves in half and then regenerate. So any mutation that doesn't kill the stem cell in which it occurs basically gets propagated through the body in the subsequent generation. They hold on to, this is called somatic inheritance. They hold on to all of these mutations. They don't clean them up uh, the way that the rest of us do. And so their genome is a complete mess. Uh, they, they can be mixoploid, meaning every cell has a different number of chromosomes. Uh, they look, the, the, it, it actually looks, looks a lot like, like what we would say of a tumor genome, and yet uh, it, has, it has all of these properties. Now, this is really strange. Uh, in, in, in no course of, of cell developmental biology, genetics, and, and so on, does anybody give you a theory that would predict why the animal with the messiest genome would actually be the most regenerative, cancer-resistant, and immortal? Okay, because what we are, to, what we're told instead is that uh, the, the 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 genome and 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 your your genotype is actually a critical determinant of all your capacities. This goes exactly backwards. Why would the animal with the worst genome have all these amazing properties? Now they have one more interesting property, which is interesting for aging, which is which is this. Uh, they're smart. You can train them, and so if you make little. Um, 
uh, little little bumps uh, like this on the uh, laser laser etch little bumps on the surface and you feed them with liver on this region and so they remember that this is sort of a safe place where they can eat then you can cut off their heads and the tail will sit there for a week and a half doing nothing they will then regenerate eventually a brain uh, the the head with the entire brain and then you will find out that these animals still remember the original training so what you see in this model system you can actually look at uh, the distribution of memory in the rest of the body, meaning outside the brain, and most importantly, the imprinting of that information onto a new brain as it develops. Besides uh, kind of a fundamental um, uh, philosophical implications, what, what the, the medical uh, kind of uh, uh, impact of this is that in the future, when we have regenerative therapies that replace uh, cells in a human uh, patient's brain, which may have six or seven decades of uh, uh, memories and personality and so on with, with progeny of naive uh, new cells. The question is what happens to the personality of that patient? And uh, th these, these kind of models start to suggest that actually it, it may, there may be considerable hope that, uh, that, that these, these uh, properties are actually spread farther than, than one thinks and may actually be imprinted onto the new tissue. So let's think about how all this amazing plasticity works, regeneration of body and of memories. Um, how, how, how does it work? Well, the key is this, that all of us uh, used to be individual cells. We all started life as an unfertilized oocyte, a quiescent oocyte. That's a, that's a little pile of, 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 of biochemistry. And through this process of development, you, you become one of these creatures or perhaps uh, you know, one, one like this. So, yeah, this is uh, Rene Descartes, um, who is going to have all kinds of uh, opinions about, uh, about uh, uh, the living beings and machines and so on. But notice that this process is completely continuous. There is no magical uh, flash in, in during development where you say this this is the moment where you went from being chemistry and physics as a as a quiescent oocyte to a being with um, with with metacognitive capacities and so on. This is a a slow and gradual developmental process, and uh, this is this is the sort of thing we're made of. Now now this is a free living organism known as a lacrimaria. There's no brain. There's no nervous system. It's one cell. And all of its problems are solved within a single cell. So its metabolic needs, its physiological needs, its behavioral, uh, morphological repertoire, all of this is taken care of in one cell. So while these, these individual cells solve little tiny uh, kind of uh, goal states on, at the level of a single cell, together they work towards very large scale construction projects like this. And that process, um, what we're going to do is, is look at uh, the involvement in that process of something that I refer to as intelligence. What do I mean by intelligence? Uh, I mean what William James meant, which is the ability to reach the same goal by different means. That's it. When I say intelligence, I do not mean it has to do anything with brains. I don't mean it has to be this kind of metacognitive, I know how smart I am, or I know what I know. It just means the ability to deploy some level of competency to reach the same goal state by different means, depending on what's happening in the environment. So some level of ingenuity and problem solving. So let's see, let's see some examples. Uh, uh, one thing we know about development is that it's very reliable. So you start off uh, as a single, uh, single cell, the egg, and then reliably this collection of cells navigates that space of possible shapes to reach that species specific morphology, a normal organism. But actually it's reliable, but it isn't hardwired. Because if you come along halfway through and, and split the animal, uh, the, the embryo in half or in quarters, you don't get two half bodies as you would with a typical um, device uh, that we've made until now. Um, what instead you'll get is two perfectly normal monozygotic twins. In fact, this is a system that can reach this. this so so here's, the, here's the kind of abstract uh, anatomical uh, morphous space. Here's the, the, the ensemble of states we recognize as a normal human anatomy. And you can actually get there from, from multiple... Uh, multiple different starting positions, even avoiding some local maxima, because this is not a hardwired system. Not only is regulative development like that, but in some animals, uh, they do that as adults. So here's this, here's this axolotl, the salamander that can regenerate its limbs, its eyes, its jaws, its spinal cord and tail, uh, ovaries, portions of the brain and heart. Uh, and what it looks like is this, if you, if you amputate a, a leg anywhere along this distance, what the cells will do is rapidly grow and undergo morphogenesis to restore exactly what's needed, and then they stop. And it can do, and it can do that from this position, from this, from 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 any position. It makes ex only what's needed. Uh, this is the most amazing part of regeneration: is that it stops. 
How does it know when to stop? Well, it stops when a correct salamander arm has been completed. That's when it stops. So we need to start to understand how does it know where it's going in this anatomical morphous space? How, what are the policies guiding the navigation in the space of, the, of, of these cells? And how do they know when they've gotten there? By the way, this isn't just for, frog, for frogs and flatworms and, 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 and salamanders. Uh, humans have some of this, and, and mammals, uh, some mammals have more. Uh, of course, the human liver is highly regenerative. Uh, deer, a large adult mammal, regenerates uh, up to a centimeter and a half of new bone per day when they're regrowing their antlers. And human children can uh, regenerate their fingertips below a certain age. If you just keep the wound clean, they will actually regrow a cosmetically normal fingertip. So, so we have this critical question. How does uh, the collective decision-making of these cell groups determine what they're supposed to be building, when they're supposed to stop, and, and, and actually what are the failure modes? Why doesn't it work in humans all the time? Why are we not like uh, axolotls or salamanders? So we started to study this process, um, and in particular, uh, starting to look at these questions of how do collections of cells represent uh, the goal states that guide their um, construction uh, projects. And so we took our inspiration from the nervous system, because, because if you're trying to think of an example of a collection of cells that can store large-scale navigational set points in some kind of space and then act to implement them and then stop when they're done. Of course, the nervous system is the best example we have of that. And, and so uh, what allows it to do that is this. The hardware looks like this. You've got, you've got uh, cells we call neurons. They uh, have these little ion channel proteins in their cell membranes, which move uh, ions around and generate a voltage potential. Um, this... Uh, may or may not be propagated to their neighbors via electrical synapses known as gap junctions. So that, that's, that's the, that, that kind of excitable medium is the, is the hardware. And what it does is it underlies the software, which is the physiology of electrical states moving through the system. This is a, a, a video which this group made of um, the uh, real-time uh, electrical activity in the zebrafish brain. And it is the commitment of neuroscience that all of the animal's cognitive capacity. So, so all of the computation, all of the memories, the goals, the, the preferences, the uh, behavioral repertoires, all of it is encoded in this electrical activity. And so there's this process of neural decoding, this idea that if, if we knew how, we would, we would be uh, scanning these electrical states and uh, conv uh, uh, decoding them to really understand what the animal is thinking, what it's seeing, and so on. Actually, there's been some progress in this, both in human patients and in, uh, and in mice and, and so on has been some progress in, in this neural decoding. But uh, the really interesting aspect of this is that this is not unique to the brain. Uh, every cell in your body has ion channels. Uh, most cells have these gap junctions to their neighbors. And you can imagine a very parallel, and this is what we've been doing for uh, 25 years now, you can imagine a very parallel uh, process where you take, uh, you take all of the tools and concepts of neuroscience and you simply port them outside of the nervous system and ask, okay, what uh, what 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 are the computations that uh, the rest of the body cells are doing, and might they underlie a kind of decision making, in particular the one we care about, which is morphogenetic uh, solution to morphogenetic problems, injury, aging, cancer, and and so on. So so what we have here is a really clean isomorphism where uh, what the nervous system does is use the electrophysiological software to make decisions, and those decisions. Uh, result in signals being given to your muscles, which move you through three-dimensional space. But this amazing system didn't evolve out of nowhere. What actually happened was that it specialized the far more ancient, evolutionarily basal a bioelectric system, which works in a very simpler, sim similar way. It was here long before nerves uh, and, 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 and uh, muscles evolved. What it does is uh, exactly the same thing. Networks of electrically active cells produce bioelectrical signals that control all of your body cells but they don't move you through three-dimensional space. They move your body configuration through anatomical morphous space. This is the system that evolution pivoted into the control of behavior when it was uh, uh, speed optimized for, for, for uh, nerve and muscle. And so um, you can read more about it here, but the point is that this is, this is as ancient as bacterial biofilms. Already evolution had figured out that uh, processing information, storing memories, um, uh, collating, um, uh, inputs from from uh, sort of uh, spatially distant uh, areas was really well accomplished by bioelectrical networks. So what we did was uh, we developed some of the first tools to read and write these electrical pattern memories in morphogenetic contexts. So the first is a set of voltage dye techniques 
which, um, so what you're seeing here is this is a voltage sensitive fluorescent dye. This is an early frog embryo. Um, you're looking at all the conversations that these cells are having with each other about who's going to be left, right, uh, dorsal, ventral, and so on. And uh, this is a video taken by um, Danny Adams in our group that basically uh, allows you to allows you to see much like people do with with uh, scanning activity in the brain allows you to see all the electrical conversations now uh, we can also do a lot of modeling and look at the various channels and pumps that are there and ask how does uh, how uh, where do these gradients uh, come from and i want to show you a couple of examples this is a time lapse uh, also made by danny of the first uh, stages of a, of a frog embryo putting its face together. So what you see here, and this is grayscale instead of colorized, but same idea, the, 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 the brightness value indicates voltage. And this is one frame taken from that video. So what you can see here is that long before these organs are actually formed, the tissue here already has a plan of where everything is going to go. Here's the eye, here's the mouth, here are the placodes, uh, and this eye is going to come, come in uh, shortly, uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, what happens is that, uh, this, this is a native in, um, essential component of normal development. And uh, not only can you monitor this for in, incipient defects, but we actually know that this is functional. This is instructive. If we move this bioelectrical pattern, the gene expression changes and the anatomy follows. I, I will show you that momentarily. So this is a normal part of development, a normal, um, a normal uh, a pre-pattern. This is a pathological pre-pattern where if we inject a, a, a human oncogene, there will eventually be a tumor. But even before that tumor becomes histologically apparent, you can already see using voltage dye that uh, these cells have basically disconnected from their neighbors. And at this point, all they're going to do is roll back to their ancient amoeba-like lifestyle. As far as they're concerned, the rest of the body is just external environment. So we'll talk about the cancer soon. So, um, so, so we developed some techniques to, to actually start to read these patterns. And then we developed uh, even sort of the more important component, which is the functional technology to, to, to change them, to write, not only to read these, these uh, data states, but to, to actually rewrite them. And we basically took everything from, the, from neuroscience. So there are no uh, waves, no frequencies, no electromagnetic radiation, no, no magnets, uh, nothing like that. What we do is manipulate the native electrical interface that these cells are using to control each other's behavior, which are the ion channels and the gap junctions. So we use uh, we can we can uh, genetically, pharmacologically, or optically uh, control the various ion channels, and that changes the voltage states directly. Or we can control the gap junctions, which determines who talks to whom. So the topology of the network, and that corresponds to synaptic plasticity and intrinsic plasticity. If this was a if this was a neural tissue, so now I want to show you some examples of what happens when you do this. Right? Why why do I think that these electrical states actually mean anything for morphogenesis? And so this is uh, I'll show you a couple of examples. This is one of them. So so here's an embryo. I showed you that in in that electric face uh, image you saw that there was a particular, bi a particular bioelectric pattern that said, put an eye here. So we simply said, okay, if we recapitulate that pattern somewhere else, well, could we convince other cells to make an eye? And so in this case, in this example, we've taken some uh, ion channel uh, RNA encoding some, some potassium channels, which we knew would, would induce that state. We, we inject them into precursors of cells that are going to make gut. So this is endoderm. And sure enough, they will go ahead and make a very nice eye. Now this, by the way, is... Um, uh, uh, counter to what you will see in the developmental biology textbook, which says that only the anterior norectoderm up here is competent to make eye. This isn't true. Well, it's true if you stick with the master eye gene called PAC6, but it isn't true if you go upstream to the bioelectric pattern and you can make eyes anywhere, on the tail, on the gut, um, anywhere. Notice a couple of interesting things about this. First of all, that uh, it tells you that these bioelectric patterns are instructive. We're not just screwing up some, some, some uh, uh, existing process. We're actually telling these cells to build an organ, uh, uh, which has all the right lens and retina and optic nerve and all the, all the right things. Second is note the modularity. What we did not do was put in enough information to specify how to build an eye. We don't have any idea of how to build an eye. There are lots of different cell types that are required in a very precise arrangement to make a proper eye. We didn't do any of that. What we did was, uh, provide a, a high level trigger. Uh, if you're a coder, this is basically a subroutine call that tells these cells, you need to make an eye. That's it. Everything else is all the, all the complexities pushed onto the system itself, which is a very nice property for regenerative medicine. So it's highly modular. The bioelectric code is not a code for single cells. It's a code for organs and up. The other, the other, which, and, and the other um, kind of capacity, which is 
which is really interesting, and this harkens back to, to this idea of the cells as a collective intelligence, is this. Um, th this is a, uh, a cross-section of a lens sitting out in the tail of a tadpole somewhere that we've induced. The blue cells, the labeled cells here, are the ones that have the ectopic ion channel. But notice what's happening. There's not enough of them to make a proper lens. So what they've done is recruit a bunch of their normal neighbors. They've hijacked some of these other cells to participate with them in this construction project. This is something that often happens in other collective intelligences like ants and termites, where uh, a few of them will actually recruit as many neighbors as needed to, to uh, complete some, some larger task. All of that is intrinsic to the tissue. We did not have to do any of that. All we said was build an eye all of the parts where you where the cells can have to detect, is there enough of us to build the eye? If not, how do we signal to the other cells to get them? What, what should be the size of the eye, the structure of the eye? All of this is handled by the tissue itself. What we are doing is taking advantage of these competencies, including um, recruitment. So we can, using these same techniques, we can make uh, we can make extra forebrains, as you can see here. We can make extra legs. Here are some six-legged frogs. We can make extra hearts, uh, extra otocysts or inner ear. Um, lots of different organs that we don't know how to make yet. Um, also, we can make fins. This is kind of interesting. Tadpoles aren't supposed to have fins. That's more of a fish thing. We'll get to that um, momentarily. And so, so uh, having, having seen that these, that these bioelectric pattern memories can actually call up different organs, we began a, a, a project in uh, regenerative medicine of the limb. And so what happens here in a frog, frogs, unlike salamanders, do not regenerate their legs at this stage. And so you cut off the, the leg and 45 days later, there's basically nothing. By the way, within 30 seconds of amputating, so here's this bioelectrical signal at the wound, within 30 days, 30 seconds of this amputation, you see uh, the opposite untouched leg has lit up exactly the same way. So there's some kind of long range and, and it's not neural. You can, you can take out all the, all the spinal cord and all the neurons, it still works. Uh, there's this long-range connection that um, uh, kind of uh, carries uh, information about the anatomical order. But what we what we did is is uh, we designed a drug cocktail uh, having to do with uh, the ion uh, the, the 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 ion levels and thus the voltages of the cells in the wound to give it a particular bioelectrical state that says rebuild the leg. And when we do this, here's what happens. Within uh, within a couple of days, this MSX1 uh, major uh, blastema marker is expressed. Here it is. This, the, the leg starts to grow by 45 days later, you've already got some toes, you've got a toenail. Um, eventually you get a very uh, respectable leg and it's touch sensitive and motile. So the animal can, can feel it. Um, the treatment itself is 24 hours with this, with this drug cocktail. Uh, the leg growth in an adult frog takes a year and a half. You get a year and a half of leg growth from a 24 hour intervention. We do not touch them uh, in between. So the idea is not to micromanage this process. It's not to tell the stem cells what to do. It's not to uh, control the morphogenesis. It's to very early on to shift the, um, the, the navigation policy of this collection of cells towards building a leg and away from scarring and, uh, and, 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 and blockage. And that's it. It's, a, it's an early stimulus. And then you leave the system alone and let it do what it needs to do. So at this point, I have to do a disclosure because uh, Dave Kaplan and I are um, scientific co-founders of a company called Morphoceuticals Inc. And the goal is to take these, these uh, insights and now to do this in, in mammals. And so the idea is we're, we're currently in mice now, uh, hopefully someday in, in human patients, but obviously we're not, we're not there yet. This is, this is kind of just the beginning. So at this point, what I'd like to do is to go back to the planaria and kind of to talk about, um, again, the role of the role of bioelectricity and this idea of pattern memories and how does it help us to understand how a body keeps itself together? Because this is really in terms of a definitive solution to aging, this is really it. We really need to understand how, I mean, cells come and go uh, all throughout the lifespan. How does a particular uh, large scale anatomy hold together even though cells are coming and going? And what does it take to uh, reinforce that so that so that we have a better health span and that we can we can retard um, or or abolish uh, this as planaria have this whole this whole uh, aging process. So I just want to show you what what we've done in planaria. So here is a, um, a typical one-headed flatworm. So you cut off the head and the tail. You've got this middle fragment. Uh, this is a, this is a, a, a genetic marker that shows us where the anterior cells are. So these are the cells that are uh, that think they're in the front of the of the of the worm, and and so they are. And so if you do this, if you cut off the head and the tail, this middle fragment gives you a nice one-headed worm. And so we asked a simple question, how does this middle fragment know how many heads it's supposed to have? How many, how many, uh, how many heads should it regrow and, and at which end? And so 
it turns out we've discovered this this uh, this this pathway involving potassium and uh, and proton fluxes. It's an uh, it's a it's an electric circuit that holds the information of how many heads you're supposed to have. And so uh, what you can do is you can you can you can visualize it. Here it is. Uh, this is this this uh, this this fragment here has a pattern that says one head, one tail. And so what we decided to do was to rewrite it, and we rewrote it, and we said no, actually two heads. And this is a little messy. The technology is still being worked out. But we said, well, well, uh, you, you, a correct planarian should have two heads like this. And then what happens is if you take that animal, and by the way, the gene expression is still normal. The anterior genes are still in the, or just in the front, not in the back. But if you recut this animal, what it does is it builds a two-headed flatworm. This is not Photoshop. These are real. Uh, the reason is because this is the actual pattern that the cells are using to know what to build and when to stop. So I promised you at the beginning that we were going to look at bioelectricity as the medium of the collection of intelligence of these cells. That's literally what this is. Um, very much like people are trying to read memories of future goal states out of living brains, we can now read bioelectrical target states out of tissue to know what it's going to build and re rewrite it. So, so this is all the cells have to go on. If, if the pattern now says two heads, that's what they're going to build. There's nothing they have to compare it with. We've rewritten the target of this homeostatic process. So um, really crucial, this electrical map is not a map of this two-headed animal. This is a map of this perfectly normal looking one-headed animal and, and before it gets cut. So basically a single, plane, a, a single flatworm can have two different representations of what a correct body shape is and uh, and this shows you the body the the these large scale features of the body shape are literally encoded in the electrical states of the circuit. Um, it's actually a kind of counterfactual memory because it isn't true right now. This animal does not have two heads right now. This is a a a, a future. It it represents what you're going to do in the future if you get injured. Now I keep calling it a memory. Why? Because if we take these two headed animals and we amputate the primary head, we get rid of this ectopic secondary head. And uh, we just let it regenerate in plain water, it will continue to give rise to two headed animals forever. Um, we now know how to set it back. And here you can see a video of uh, what, what these guys look like. So this has all the properties of memory it's long term stable, it's rewritable, uh, it has conditional recall, as I just showed you, and it has some possible discrete behaviors. So this is, this is quite subtle. Uh, you can ask, um, what determines the number of heads in a planarian? Well, on the one hand, what the genome does is create a, 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 a machine that has, by default, an electrical circuit that, 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 that naturally, by default, will, will start off saying one head. But that's not the only thing it can say. It's reprogrammable. And in fact, if you change it to say two heads, it will keep. So the actual number of heads in a planarian isn't genetically determined at all. What's genetically determined is the hardware and a kind of uh, default uh, state uh, that's, that's there if, you, if nothing else happens. So... Um, but it's not just about head number, it's also about head shape or morphology. So what you can do is you can take this uh, triangular headed planarian, amputate the head, let the rest of the body regenerate while you block some of this electrical communication, it gets confused, and sometimes it makes the right head, but sometimes it makes round heads like this S. mediterranea or flat heads like this P. felina. Um, these other species are about 100 to 150 million years distant. There's nothing genetically wrong with any of these animals that we've done no genomic editing, no, um, no synthetic circuits. Uh, not only the head shape, but the shape of the brain is uh, just like these other species. Right? And so what you're doing here is you're exploring other regions of the morpho, the morpho space for this genome. No, normally it goes here where it belongs, but actually it can land in some other attractors that are typically occupied by other genomes. But you can visit that uh, in software basically by, by just changing the bioelectrical signaling without actually um, having to change the genomic hardware. And you can go further than this. You can explore the latent morphospace outwards into and, and look at shapes that don't look like planaria at all. So you can make these uh, three-dimensional cylindrical forms. You can make these weird spiky shapes. You can make hybrid forms. And this ability of cells to build other things than what they normally build is everywhere. It is, um, is, is it, it, what, what evolution gives us when it produces uh, cells and bodies are a set of uh, really, really highly, uh, highly hackable, highly programmable uh, machines for solving morphogenetic problems. And not only bioengineers like us learn to uh, tap into these controls, but animals do it too. So for example, in the plant world, this is an oak leaf. And what, what's happened here is that you, you would look at an oak leaf and you would think that these plant cells have only one uh, kind of capability, which is, to, which is to grow this nice flat green thing. But in fact, 
what happens is when, when, uh, when hacked by a, an insect embryo, a wasp, it gets the plant cells to build these kind of um, remarkable three-dimensional red, red structures out of the plant cells. These are not wasp cells, these are plant cells. And so the plant is basically doing what we do rationally. The plant does it evolutionarily, the wasp does it evolutionarily by providing signals that trigger these cells to build something completely different. So this plasticity, this ability to uh, get cells to build various things or to reinforce the standard morphology is really what we're after in the control of uh, growth and form for the solution to these kind of biomedical problems. So what we're doing now is uh, building a full stack computational uh, system where you can go from the genetics that tell you which channels and pumps are in the cells to the bioelectric simulations that explain why the gradients are in a certain location, what the behavior of these gradients are, how they function as a, as, a, as, a, as a passage of time, and ultimately what this means for algorithms, for human understandable algorithms to derive anatomical structure from these kind of, uh, from these kind of uh, cell, cell behaviors. And so um, the last story that I wanna tell you for a few minutes is really um, how we use these computational platforms to repair damage. And so, so the, the, perhaps the best worked out system in the example in this is, is that of the, of the frog brain. So here's a normal tadpole brain. Here's the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. And uh, there are a wide variety of teratogens, some of them uh, chemical like nicotine, alcohol, and so on, and some of them genetic, which I'll show you in a minute, that mess up brain formation. So this animal has profound defects. You can see the brain is completely abnormal. The eyes are actually connected here. It's missing the, missing the forebrain and so on. So we asked the question, um, how could we uh, how could we repair this? How could we induce repair of such a complex organ? Doesn't, you know, if we're going to repair, don't, don't we need to uh, really understand every part of this and, and really control every, every bit of this complicated shape and function? So what we did was we built a, a model, and this, this was by um, our collaborator, Alexis Pytak, uh, who created a computational model of the bioelectrical pattern that we observed that normally tells this brain what size and shape to be. And we analyzed this computational model to understand all the various ways that it could go wrong. And uh, in particular, we asked the model to work backwards and to suggest an ion channel that we can, or one or more ion channels that we could open or close to get the pattern to the correct state from an incorrect state. So, so what you have here is you have a, you have a computer model of a bi the bioelectrics going on inside of a sheet of the nascent brain cells and the pattern is incorrect. And so you ask the model, if I wanted to get this bioelectric pattern back to what it should be, what would I need to do? What channels would I open and close? And this particular model uh, said something very interesting. It, it pointed us to this thing called the HCN2 ion channel. The HCN2 ion channel has a very particular interesting property. Long story short, it acts like a kind of like a sharpen filter in Photoshop. What it does is it sharpens voltage gradients between uh, regions of, of cells with different voltages. And here's here's what that looks like. Uh, this this is this is this is I'm showing you the 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 toughest example uh, we have, which is instead of a drug like nicotine or alcohol or something like that, we used a genetic mutation of of the Notch uh, pathway. Notch is a really critical neurogenesis gene. It's very important for formation of the brain. This is a normal brain. This is a brain of an animal with a Notch mutation. You can see uh, the forebrain is gone. The midbrain and hindbrain are a big bubble. They have no behavior. They just lay there doing nothing. Um, so, so what we did was exactly what the model said, which is that we treated it with one of, uh, one of two drugs that open up these HCN2 channels. These, by the way, are already human-approved uh, anti-epileptics. And what happens is that uh, the animals are repaired. They get their brains back. They, they not only get a pro, uh, their normal anatomy back, but they get their IQs back. You, they are, um, uh, in terms of learning rate, they are now indistinguishable from controls, whereas these guys could barely move. And so... What you see here is that some disorders, and I'm not saying this is true for, for all of them, but for some disorders, uh, really nasty hardware problems can in fact be fixed in software. All we did was temporarily uh, open a particular ion channel to trigger this kind of um, improvement of the native bioelectrical pattern. So uh, the whole kind of uh, uh, pipeline looks, looks, something, looks something like this, where we will have a system, and you can already kind of play with an early version of this online, where you choose the cell, the tissues or organs that you're interested in, whether normal or, or cancerous. It knows all the ion channels that are expressed there because these are all uh, present in databases in the literature. And then there's the simulator, 
which tells you which of these channels you would need to open or close to get this back to the correct state. And that allows you, once you know which channels, that allows you to pick a drug because uh, something like 20% of all drugs are uh, electro uh, are um, ion channel drugs, which means there's a huge uh, potential pool of so-called electroceuticals that can be used to, to, to infer how to make these changes from this computer model. Um, uh, one just one kind of quick piece of information to remind us that this is not all just for these lower animals that we work with. Um, all of these different ion channels, which work exactly the same way in some of our model systems, have all come out of uh, channelopathy studies in human patients. And in fact, if you look at the gene expression downstream of various um, bioelectrical interventions, as, as we did here, uh, all the, the, the genes downstream of, of frog, axolotl, and human mesenchymal stem cells are overlapping. So the targets are all the same. So this is a very ancient, highly conserved system for body regulation. And we have, we have a lot of confidence because of that, that, that what we learn now in, in animal models is going to uh, work well in, in, in medicine. So um, the last, uh, just for a couple of minutes, the last, uh, kind of, the last uh, story I want to tell you is about cancer. So what we have here, again, let's just remind ourselves what bodies are, because, because the, real, the, the right question for cancer isn't why we get cancer. The right question is, I think, why isn't it all cancer all the time? Why is there anything other than cancer? Because we are made of individual cells that used to be individual or organisms that basically uh, have two goals, uh, to go wherever life is good, metabolically, and to proliferate for each cell to become two cells. But what evolution has done is given them some, some amazing hardware, including bioelectrical hardware, but also biochemical and biomechanical, that allows them to, instead of working on unicellular level, tiny little projects, what they do is they, they work towards something much bigger. They, they, they um, together as a collective, they navigate anatomical space to build something like this. And if it gets damaged, they will rebuild it very much like ants do for, a, for a, you know, a, an ant colony and, and so on. Uh, they continue to build something very large. But this whole system has a failure mode, and that whole that failure mode is cancer. This is glio, glioblastoma um, in vitro. Uh, what happens is that when individual cells get uh, disconnected from this collective, they 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 go back to their ancient unicellular past. As far as they're concerned, uh, the rest of the body is external environment. They're no more selfish than the rest of your body cells. It's just that their cells are smaller. Cancer is a um, is a reduction of uh, the diameter of, of the self. So for, from, from, from something very large where they're all part of building this one organ, now, now it shrinks down to the level of a single cell and it just goes to pursue little single cell agendas. Uh, so what we decided to do was to use this kind of very strange way of thinking about it to develop a therapeutic. And so here's, here's the, um, uh, here are these tumors that are injected, that are caused by injecting human oncogenes, for example, nasty KRAS mutants and so on. And you can see here, the, the, the oncogene is labeled. It's in red. It's very strong in this area. In fact, it's all over the place. This is the same animal. Um, there's no tumor. Because even though if you were to sequence this genetically, you would see the mutation, you would say, ah, well, this is, this is of course, going to, be a, going to be a tumor here. There isn't any tumor, despite the, the, the oncogene is still there. We haven't gotten rid of it. It's quite strong. But the cells, we force the cells to electrically remain connected to the rest of the tissue with by by including an ion channel that sets a particular voltage and we've basically forced them to remain part of this construction project that builds nice skin and nice muscle regardless of what the oncogene is telling it to do which is to disconnect and and go off on your own so you can see that and and so we're now we're currently in in human uh, glioblastoma um kind of uh, applications to to see if we can transition this to medicine so um uh i'm gonna just uh, summarize and then and then give you a couple of um Okay, uh, bigger, bigger thoughts. So what I've tried to argue is that there's a physiological software layer that sits between the genotype and the anatomy. And it's a really important tractable target for biomedicine. It's not all about uh, the, the molecular details of the genome. There's actually this physiological layer that's critical. Uh, evolution discovered very early on how powerful the electrical component is of that, of that layer. And lots of cells uh, hack each other's behavior by controlling uh, these large-scale electrical patterns, we think that uh, cracking this code in the sense of uh, neural, de in the same sense as neural decoding, will reveal how uh, cell networks and, 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 and tissues make group decisions. And so we already have applications where we can rewrite these pattern memories to program uh, new large-scale shapes. 
And there are some really exciting AI tools that are coming online for the design of uh, specific strategies for regenerative medicine. So this is going to be uh, a a anything that's going to help us control um, real-time uh, growth and form is going to be really critical for the aging problem. And uh, in bigger picture, I think that uh, bioelectrical signaling is a, very much like it does in the brain, serves as a kind of cognitive glue that binds individual cells towards larger purpose, which is to maintain an organism uh, against disorder, which is, which is aging, cancer, and everything else. So um, kind of the, last, the last thing I just, I just want to mention is if we look at uh, the space of all biomedical interventions, you've got basically uh, bottom-up conventional strategies, which are, which are all of these kind of hardware-focused things. And then you've got some, some ways to treat this top-down, and this is only now beginning to be uh, sort of uh, uh, exploited, and you can see you can see lots more in these in these papers. Um, but this is this is where this is where we get to take advantage of the native intelligence of cells and tissues. The fact that they're not just clockwork; they have specific uh, because they used to be independent organisms. They have preferences, they have competencies, they have memory, they have trainability. I haven't even uh, mentioned all all of those the, the data for all of that. Um, but there's a, there's a large uh, field of uh, of emerging information on that. And really, being able to take advantage of it is extremely powerful. And this is and this is key. People who study uh, uh, placebo effects and uh, expectation effects, and and really at this point, anybody who studies uh, uh, any kind of uh, drug action, uh, has realized that the mind plays a really important part in this. And so, so Fabrizio Benedetti has this great quote that I love, which is that uh, words and drugs have the same mechanism of action. And he literally uses a brain scanning and, and those kind of technologies to really show the mechanism of action of having expectations about what various pharmaceuticals do versus what the actual pharmaceutical does. And I think that bioelectricity is an incredibly uh, attractive target as a communication interface between large scale intelligence, between the, your expectations, uh, the, you know, these uh, context, contextual uh, behavioral cues, which is what uh, informs a lot of uh, whether a lot of how successful certain um, certain um, uh, ph pharmaceuticals are going to be, and the actual molecular level outcomes. Because as as uh, as a human being or as any other animal, your decision to get out of bed in the morning, this high level kind of executive decision of what you want to do has to filter down to change the molecular properties of the cell membrane in your muscle cells. In order to get out of bed, you have to depolarize those muscle cells. And so, so that bioelectric interface is, is literally what takes a high level uh, co uh, content of, a, uh, of, a, of, a, uh, of an intelligent metacognitive individual and converts it into changes of molecular signaling within the cells. And with the bioelectricity is what does that. And, and if we understood really how to manipulate that 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 pathway, we could have really, really radical medical applications that are uh, completely different than trying to cobble together um, the addressing of symptoms bottom up via drug design and things like that. So I'll stop here. I'm going to thank um, all the uh, students and, and, and postdocs who did all the work and uh, my, my many collaborators. Again, uh, three disclosures. These are these are companies that um, that we work with. Uh, our other uh, funders are here, um, and most of all, the uh, model systems, because the animals do all the heavy lifting here. So um, thank you. I'll stop here and take any questions. I just want to say, wow, that was great. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely fantastic. Appreciate it. Thank you. Very well put together. That was amazing. Oh, yes. Thank you, uh, Michael. Yeah, mind-blowing stuff. Hi, how are you doing? Hello. Uh, yeah, I've been meaning to ask you, I'm just trying to get my head around this, this bioelectric pattern that you're referring to. So how is it distributed across the organism? You have different ion channels active in different parts of the organism. How, how do you set it up? Yeah, um, that's true in that there are there are of course regionalizations of ion channel expression but it doesn't that that isn't the major part of it because because remember that if you imagine um imagine a field of cells where every cell has exactly the same ion channels okay exactly the same ion channels you can still have all kinds of complex patterns of bioelectric states 
because of self-organization of, uh, you know, think of Turing patterns, right? And the chemical, so this is f very familiar to, to, to people who think about chemical signals. You can have a well-mixed medium where, where all, the, all the chemicals are homogenous, and yet you can have these very complex self-organizing patterns. Exactly the same thing is true in the bioelectric circuits. You don't need to necessarily have different ion channels to have different electrical states. You can, you can self-organize uh, very, very kind of uh, uh, clever patterns but but on top of that are always overlaid the fact that actually yes some cells do have different ion channels than other cells but when you control like where the eye goes for example oh. you go and localize your ion channel and and the state of these channels so uh, yeah so the yeah there, so there's two ways there's there's two we have two different uh, applications that I showed you one is yeah in the case of the in the case of the eye we inject the channel RNA into a specific region because that's where we want the eye to form. So, th so there's some localization there. On the other hand, uh, for example, in the work that we did to induce, uh, let's say, tail regeneration in a, in a tadpole that normally won't regenerate it, we soak the whole animal. And only the wound at the tail is what is what actually regenerates. We didn't provide any spatial specificity. And that's because there's also an element, and this is something else that's that's sort of stolen from, from neuroscience here, is there's an element of attention in the system. So, so the cells that are not injured, that that are in a quiescent location where everything is good, they they ignored our signal completely. And so it's only the cells at the wound that need to know what to do that uh, actually responded and they grew a tail. The rest of it didn't, did, did nothing. And we have many, many examples of that actually. Yeah. The same thing for those, um, for the, for the anti-epileptics to repair the brain. We didn't inject them in a specific location. We soaked the whole animal and, and the brain was repaired and everything else. In fact, in fact, in fact, other things uh, got slightly better. That's, that's a whole other thing is that it's actually a tune-up for the whole organism. Um, other organs, you know, developmental noise, which is like this variation, you know, normal variation, all of that got got crunched down into into these embryos look like uh, I, I, I had scored them myself when I first when I first saw the you know this this effect I, I looked at it myself they look like they come off an assembly line I mean they were just like perfect like every each one was exactly like each other just reduces the noise so we didn't have to we didn't have to produce any spatial specificity there wow. do wounds have electrical signals sorry do wounds emit electrical signals. Yes, yes. This has been studied. I believe the first work on this was like in the 1880s or something. Uh, yes, absolutely. So, so every epithelial layer has a voltage across it. And if you poke a hole in it, it'll short circuit and all the cells nearby know where the wound is by following the electric field lines. And these things have been measured by, I think, uh, Emile Dubois-Raymond was the first to measure this in, in the late 1800s. This has been around for a long time. We've had several questions mm -hmm. in the chat queue that I'd like to get to now. I notice Miles has had his hand up. He organized this, so he gets priority. Miles, and I, I don't recall who was who was asking another question that that may have been Paul or or someone. We'll we'll get back to you, uh, Miles. Thank you, Johnny. I I I don't claim the priority, but thank you very much, uh, Doctor Levine. Doctor Levine, sorry, I'm 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 from you know British. <laughs> British expression here in South Africa, we say Levine. But okay, um, the two things I wanted to talk about was neural, uh, neural cellular automata. Neural, if I don't know if you've come across the term because they say they are inspired by your work. So uh, there's this distill.pub. Yeah, um, that was, that um, was our website. paper. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, that was we we collaborated with this with uh, with Alex Mordvinsov's team. Yeah, I know I know the papers okay. you mean. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, so, so that that's the one thing. So that then I'm, that's answered my question. So that's basically modeling the same thing in, in in software. And the other question was that we have a paper from uh, Jad Hav, uh, I think it's 2019, showing that in the in the adult in the adult the human adult any uh, a, a mammal or, or um, eukaryote there is the um, embryonic program and the uh, a fetal program of development in the genome, but it is switched off. And they've been able to, uh, uh, well, I suppose if you look at the Yamanaka factors, in a sense, they seem to be switching them on again. So, so the um, embryonic program and the fetal program are switched off. They are called hypo, hypomethylated. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this or what you're also familiar with this. Okay, then that also answers my question. 
Yeah, I mean the thing, the thing with the Yamanaka the, 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 the thing with the Yamanaka factors is that what you're doing there is regulating single cell state. So you're telling one cell that it's a primitive uh, embryonic like cell. And from there, that cell needs to be able to figure out what to do by itself. The, the, the problems that we've been talking about are not single cell problems. They are large scale morphogenetic problems. And if all you do is uh, set up a bunch of um, uh, undifferentiated uh, cells without the proper uh, anatomical cues, what you will end up with is at best the teratoma or some other some other kind of uh, tumor that grows out of control. They it's it's not enough to have you know the ce the cells themselves are like the building blocks. Yes, you need undifferentiated cells to make the various tissues, but it isn't enough by themselves. You will not get the three dimensional uh, correct patterning. So I think that uh, you know obviously the Yamanaka factors are are incredibly interesting and and important as a technology, but it doesn't provide the the the, the answer to what we're looking for. I don't I don't think. Um, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Just one last comment. Um, oh, yeah. uh, Dr. Sinclair at Harvard, they showed that when they crushed the optic nerve in a, in a mouse, the same biochemical pathways were stimulated as during the um, OSK Yamanaka factors. So it's as if the wound had the same effect as the reprogramming. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not surprised. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, yes, I, and I know, I know David's work quite well. Uh, I'm, I'm not surprised. I think that's 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 a fantastic finding, and I think that that's the right way to do this. In other words, it's the it's the it's the envi it's the cellular environment and the pattern memories in that environment that are needed to tell the cells what to do. It's not enough to just have plastic cells bottom up. Very good. Um, Justin's next in queue. Actually, um, kudos to Justin. He's doing some out outstanding things in our community. He's been making uh, uh, videos lately, and I was honored to present one on genomic analysis and longevity genes. So, Justin, do you want to read this, or Dr. Levin, do you want to just uh, read this yourself? It's up on the screen now. Yeah, I see it. Um, yeah. Uh... Well, if, if, it's it's um, it's it's hard to say uh, more more influential. It's sort of like um, I mean they do they go hand in hand. It's it's the 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 right way to think about this is using the framework of software and hardware. So without the right hardware, your software is not going to do anything. So so hardware is really important, and that's what the genetics does. The genetics nails down the cellular hardware that you have. However, uh, if the hardware is good, and bio biological hardware is definitely of that class, the hardware does not by itself uh, determine what's going to happen. It's the actual software and the reprogrammability uh, features that are going to determine what happens. And I showed you one example, well, I showed you several examples where the physiology overrides the genetics. So you can make worms with the wrong species heads, even though the genetics is normal. You can make animals with a, gen with a very nasty uh, oncogenic mutation, which in fact do not get cancer, even though the genetics are, are wrong. Um, and, uh, and, and you can, you can have a notch mutation and still uh, get a normal brain if the, if the electrophysiology is, is managed correctly. So, uh, you know, I, I'm certainly not going to say that genetics isn't important. It's, it, it, it's, it's critical. But we now have ways to override the default behaviors that are given by the genetics. And I think we now have a better understanding of what the genetics does. It doesn't code directly for uh, any of these form and functions. It, uh, it's just the beginning of the control path. Okay. Yeah. I mainly asked that just because for so many years and years and years, so much funding has gone into genetics and, mm -hmm. you know, and that that's the solution to aging and rejuvenation. Uh, but it seems as though that's a minor part of the issue, uh, you know, listening to you and seeing the work that you've done. Yeah, you know, I, I I hesitate to say minor. I think it's also going to be important because I can I can imagine sort of a two part solution where you you need both, right? So so one one can one can think about um, what actually go what actually happens during regeneration. Is it that is it that cells are no longer remembering the correct pattern memories to keep up the tissues of the body? or perhaps that information is there, but the cells are unable to execute. So we actually don't know the answer to that. And it's entirely possible that you will need both. You'll need a way to strengthen the, the bioelectric pattern memory 
and you will need a way to improve the cell's uh, abilities to to obey, and that that may be uh, some kind of a, a you know have a have a, a, a genetic or biochemical component to it. And Justin, was your next question answered? Yes, my next question was answered. That's right. Okay, next in line, John Kramer. And anyone who wants to ask a question verbally, please click the little hand raising icon and we'll put you in queue. Okay, John. Um, okay, how does the planet get energy and biomass to regenerate? I have an idea, but Dr. Levin. Yeah, what happens is it's it's actually extremely interesting. Um, these planarians, uh, when 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 the 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 fragment starts to regenerate, uh, it actually starts to shrink because it has to be the correct size to match the tiny little heads and tails that are going to be formed. Right, it's trying to keep proportional, so it shrinks. And the way it shrinks is is through autophagy. So it actually eats some of its own tissues. And that ends up uh, being used to to rebuild. And and in fact, even without injury, the the worm is constantly uh, remodeling. So if you starve it over months, they will just get smaller and smaller. But they keep perfect proportions. So they're constantly remodeling themselves. And once you feed them, they they sort of get bigger and they stay in the right allometric scaling throughout. Amazing. All right, Jameson, uh, which genes uh, affected right after making changes? Yeah. Um, so, so I I can give you a whole list. We we analyzed all this in in several publications. So I can send them send you the list. There are many. Uh, all of the kinds of things that you've heard of. So, Wnt pathway, um, uh, BMP, FGF, all of those pathways are there. But it's it's thousands. Uh, there are, there are many many genes that are that are targeted. All right. John Kramer, specific ion chain, the drug. Yeah, uh, that depends on the drug. Uh, there are some drugs that are that are extremely dirty and non-specific. There are other drugs that are much more specific. Uh, the good news for some of these applications is that you actually don't want to be too specific because if you take a, if you let's say you block uh, you know KV two point one, well KV two point two is right there to take its place. And so you sometimes want something that will take out a whole family or in fact a whole class to make the change that you want. But uh, it, it varies greatly across the different drugs. OK. Um, Paul? Yeah, I, I have a question uh, with, your, with respect to your hardware software analogy. Uh, I, I've been in computer science for many, many, many years. Uh, so I know something about that. And, and my, it's, a, it's more a comment from you because the difference I see between the, the uh, biological things uh, and computer software and hardware is that with computer hardware, the hardware doesn't generate and determine the software in, in any sense. In, in other words, uh, you, you build a piece of hardware and you don't automatically get software programs that are running it, okay? So how does how does the and so I want your comment is the idea of how does the genome uh, and the bio, the basic biology generate the software in a sense? Yeah. Um, so so what what you're saying is true with respect to the classic uh, kind of uh, architecture where uh, where 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 those two things are quite separate, right? So you build the hardware and then somebody else has to put the software on it. That, of course, is only one type of computing device. So we now have self-organizing uh, computational systems where nobody has to put the, the, the software on top. So this is the field of uh, self-organizing uh, robotics, artificial life, uh, where where we build these circuits that have a... So just, just imagine a, um, uh, a, a collection of... Uh, you know, we can start thinking about this as a... Uh, as a collection of, uh, of electronic components for a simple analog computer, right? When you've got when you've got the components, if you connect them up in the right way, you're going to get spontaneous behavior. The whole thing is an, ele an electronic dynamical system. It's going to have spontaneous behavior, and depending on what the components are, we can interpret that behavior as various kinds of computations. There's going to be inputs, there are going to be outputs, and nobody had to explicitly program the thing. All of those computational behaviors are a feature of the dynamical components of, of the system. Now, the trick, of course, is to get the right components that take advantage of uh, various various laws of computation. The fact that, you know, these just to give you a simple example, these ion channels, 
the, they're, they're voltage gated current conductances. They're basically a transistor. So if you, if you have a circuit in the right way, you can make logic gates. If you can make logic gates, then you have various computations. All of that is a kind of a dynamic, you, you can take a dynamical systems approach to it and think of it that way, but it's much more powerful if you actually ask what computations is it doing. So I think, I think it's in biology, we have uh, very well developed something that the computer technology is only just starting to exploit, which is self-organizing co co computational circuits. That's what I think we have. Robert Young, I like where you're going. Ideas for applying this to solve aging. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I and and I, I'm certainly not an aging expert. Uh, we don't have any uh, any work directly on aging yet. Um, the idea is, I, I I think that the solution to aging is going to basically fall out of the solution to uh, all of these other disorders of morphogenesis. I think that aging is fundamentally a disorder of morphogenetic control. And when we when we and why we I don't mean just my lab, but the field as a whole. Uh, when we solve this problem of maintaining morphogenetic control, aging will be one of the applications along with regeneration, along with cancer uh, reprogramming and so on. Uh, the, the, I, th I think the key, the, key, the key is to ask how do the cells know what to do in the first place? And the solutions to that will be the solutions to aging as well. Very good. Next, another one from Jason. Let me adjust my screen. Mine was uh, just more of a comment to uh, Robert's question on how it might be applied to aging, so. Oh, okay. Jeff, Parker? Yeah. Um, yeah, so so tissue regrowth after scarring. So I, we, we don't have any uh, published data in mammals yet, but uh, we did do uh, work in the frog where we showed that even after it scars over with this, uh, what they call a um, non-permissive uh, epithelium, which normally doesn't allow the thing to regenerate, this like thick, thick, uh, epithelium, we can still trigger regeneration. So I'm optimistic, but uh, if, you're, if you're asking about you know, human patients, we don't have any data on that yet, so we'll see. Okay, and Jeff, Jeff's next question. Hmm. Uh, have you applied to common degenerative diseases of aging? Well, you may have applied, yeah. uh, answered some of that. Yeah, yeah, oh, again, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I don't know, we, we, we don't have, um, we don't have uh, data on mammalian arthritis or COPD. We we haven't done that, but I think that to the extent that figure that we figure out where normal lung tissue comes from in the first place, or what a normal joint is supposed to be, we will we will be able to trigger that regenerative process throughout. So my hope is to uh, be able to uh, uh, continuously induce uh, and 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 up upregulate basically like what planaria do where where they're constantly uh, refreshing their tissues all the time. Okay, Jason would uh, be interested in seeing that map. What? Yeah. Sorry, what what map are we talking about? Uh, at one point, you were talking about uh, sort of a mapping between um, a bioelectric signal and a change in. Uh, genes or change in gene expression. Oh, oh gene expression. I see. Yeah, uh, yeah. I can. Yeah, I, I, that's that's fine. Uh, drop me an email and I'll send you the paper. Um, I, I'll warn you in advance that uh, we did it because a lot of people are interested in that question. But I I, I found it um, highly uh, kind of uh, uh, un, uninformative because what it does is it is it tells you how individual cells are altered by these by the bioelectrical change but all the problems that we're actually interested in are not single cell problems so knowing what happens to individual uh, you know um what what happens to individual tr transcripts in in single cells is that hasn't actually told us very much about how to control the whole business you know so so when you when you turn on the eye pattern um, you see that uh, you you start to turn on all of the eye genes, so you get Pac six and Rix one uh, and all of these things. Someone's microphone is on and it's feeding back. Hang on. Yeah. Okay, we're good. Go ahead, please. Sorry. Yep, no problem. Uh, so 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 you see that those things are turned on, but what you'd really like to know is how did that collection of cells? It's not a single cell question. Uh, how did that how did that whole field of cells? take convert that bioelectric pattern 
and decide that that maps onto an eye rather than some other organ. Uh, not 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 what happened to individual cells, but how how what's the what's the large scale decoding? So so we know you know we know the genes, but that that doesn't actually answer the question. And so so it's it's some of the other kinds of approaches that we've taken with large scale uh, modeling and and some of the some of the machine learning and so on that are really going to um, answer this. Yeah, it seems like you sort of need a, a mapping then between a bioelectric signal and how it alters actual tissues or, or organs, right? That's exactly right. That that's that's exactly right. That's the bioelectric code. That's that that is precisely what we're trying to map out. Yeah. Just a quick follow-up. Um, how do you see this area of research interfacing with areas like quantum biology? Yeah, good question. Uh, I, I've been asked that before. I, I don't know specifically for quantum biology. I'm not I'm not an expert in in quantum anything and I, I don't know. So so far, everything that we've been doing here is purely classical. It's we use uh, we we don't use any any quantum formalisms yet. Uh, we basically just use uh, standard um, uh, neuroscience, standard electrophysiology, and uh, standard connectionist uh, kinds of uh, network modeling. So I, I don't know. I don't know if there's a role for um, for quantum uh, kinds of processes. I assume I assume biology exploits it, like it exploits everything else that it can that it can. But uh, our models don't include that right now. Gotcha. Thank you. OK, a couple more questions in chat. I will copy them. But first, I had one. How can we um, support your work? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I guess at this point, uh, you know, where the where the field is, is that we know what to do. Uh, we're not stuck anywhere. There are no great, um, you know, fundamental blockades other than resources. So, so right now it's pretty scalable. Meaning that if we had more people working on this, it would move faster. It's it's uh, you know not not every not every field is at that stage, but this one kind of is. So um, yeah, you know, if you know if you know of any leads on, and we have we have lots of uh, lots of uh, uh, potential sources uh, for funding, but it. It all of all of them take up significant time. Uh, pursuit of of, uh, of research funding takes significant time. So, any any uh, you know any leads on that are are helpful. Um, that's that's basically the rate limiting step at this point. Okay, I'm going to since Miles has given so oops sorry given so much of his time to organize this and other meetings, he gets priority. So. Are uh, using any AI tools? Yeah, um, we use we use a variety of uh, AI techniques. Uh, we don't really use any off the shelf tools that I can think of. Uh, we basically make most of our own, and the idea is um, to understand the decision making and the memory w of the cells themselves. So it's kind of a tight. You know, we're not we're not just using. Uh, AI tools to crunch the data. We're actually trying to understand the cells as a kind of intelligence, you know, artificial or not. That that kind of doesn't matter, but it's a kind of unconventional intelligence, and we're trying to um, we're trying to use it. Okay, Roy Cutler, good to see you again. And I'll reformat this. Are you able to reverse? No, you can read it. Yeah, um, sort of. Uh, in the case of, for, so for example, in the case of the leg regeneration, that's part of what happens. It's not so. It's not so much reversing. It's you know, for example, in the frog, much like in the human, uh, there's no de-differentiation. It just skin makes more skin, muscle makes muscle, bone makes bone, and so on. It's a more of it, it induces tissue renewal and patterning. It's not so much uh, it's not so much a, necessarily a differentiation issue. But 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 we have, for example, in vitro, you can control um, human mesenchymal stem cells that way. Uh, bioelectrically, you can control uh, whether or not they differentiate. So so this is one way to control differentiation. But that again, that's that's not really enough to to that that's not where the the, the power of the approach lies. Yeah. And how are you set for time? Do you have time for a few more? Uh, I will tell you what time is it. Uh, I, I got about five minutes. Okay. Uh, Jeff's question, and I will be reformatting another one or two that are in chat. Uh, let's see. Companies work well. Uh, 
what I, I yeah I can't say too much other than uh, we do we do have this uh, have this company called uh, Morphoceuticals uh, Inc. and um, we're we're focusing on on limb regeneration and uh, stay tuned there will be uh, there will be papers coming out uh, hopefully uh, later this year. All right, uh, John. Yeah, John's question. Um, yeah, yeah, we've used optogenetics. Uh, we've used optogenetics to trigger regeneration, to trigger limb formation, to uh, suppress cancer. Uh, unclear to me whether that's going to be really uh, the way to go in the clinic because it requires the cells to be expressing a voltage gate of a, a light gated ion channel, which is very good in the laboratory because then you know exactly what you've done and it's it's very nice. But uh, in you don't want the you don't want to have to give your patient gene therapy to get those light sensitive channels in there. So I'm not I'm not sure that will actually be how how we do the the clinic. Okay, and I was popping, and I I trust that includes an answer to John's second question. Uh, John Kramer developing drugs and okay yeah well. Uh, there's a there's a there's a huge uh, amount of emphasis on um, discovering new drugs for ion channels. So 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 lots of the uh, the big pharma companies are doing that for other reasons, not not having anything to do with bioelectricity necessarily. But uh, I, but uh, so so yes, but uh, I, that's not really the rate limiting limiting step right now. We have plenty of drugs for ion channels. I mean, we can always use more, but the the issue isn't that we don't have enough drugs for specific channels the issue l largely is that we don't have enough physiomic data so we need uh we need to re we need bioelectrical state data on health and disease in a wide range of of tissues across across uh, patients all of that and then and then we can we can develop specific strategies <clears throat> um let's see next john wenger and um I see, I mean, you said five minutes, so I'm taking that literally, and I think we have about two and a half left, so I'm, I'm watching the clock here, because I want to keep yep. you on schedule, and you've been yeah, that Yeah, we, we've never, I, I have no idea, we, in, in a planarian, we've never uh, done anything like that, phys physically moving cells around, so I, I don't know what would happen. Okay. And... Justin's question, in case you can't see it all, I'll reformat it. Yeah, um, I yeah, I, I I understand the question. Um, I'm not sure we're going to have to worry about the correct places and the correct period of time. In the frog, for example, we soak the whole animal, and we do it for 24 hours, and then we don't touch them again. And that is enough to trigger a year and a half of new organ growth in the correct place. And so. My hope is that if we if we correctly understand um, what uh, if we correctly understand how the cells process this information, we're not going to have to micromanage the the delivery uh, spatially. Yeah, the magnetic field of the Earth. Um, well, so so uh, we 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 know that the magnetic field is important for some things, as you say, like navigations. And navigation, uh, the kinds of electrical uh, signals that we are working with, uh, the the weak field of the Earth doesn't uh, doesn't really impact them. I mean, people have done experiments where you shield them off from from the magnetic field of the Earth using mu metal and things like that. And, and some people, you know, there have been some effects reported, but it's not. It's really kind of um, there's there's not this really strong evidence for the need of a magnetic field for the kinds of very, very kind of uh, strong electrical exchanges that we're talking about. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you um, so much. Oh, My Miles, uh, quick Just one. the last question. Just the last question, Dr. Levine. Um, so uh, to, if you wanted to control the electric field down to a more granular level, um, would you, on the embryonic, uh, uh, during the embryonic stage, um, would you be looking at things like nanotechnology or sort of point point uh, 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 conductors to, to sort of change the shape of the embryos? You you could, but uh, my my own thinking is that that's you, you we actually want to go in the wrong in the opposite direction. We don't want to be micromanaging the the minute uh, states. We want to have very low information contact, lar content, large scale signals 
that let the cells themselves handle all of the details. In, in everything that we've done, the most powerful interventions are the ones where we leave the most to the cells, where we do not try to micromanage it. I'm sure there will be applications where that's useful, maybe especially in synthetic uh, morphology, but um, I, I, don't, I don't think that's long-term. I don't think that's the way here. Well, as some guy who used to travel around the galaxies on a starship used to say, fascinating. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody. Great, great discussion. Really appreciate oh. it. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Great job. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> if anyone has something else to say, it's going to be a hard act to follow. Any other thoughts, ideas? Next topic, Miles, I believe you had another another thing or two to say yes no no he caught he caught the scientific community completely un, unprepared uh, from left <laughs> field he totally i think about 10 50 years ago when he started it was totally like like jason was saying the focus was on the genes and this level of control which is comprehensive it's it's the actual morphology uh was completely unexpected so uh, that's why, I mean, amazing is he's, he's, he's broken the, the barrier for organ formation. You, you see the extra limbs, the extra legs, you see them coming out of the frog. And that was a massive, massive advance. So he's really done something fantastic. Yes. Well, Miles, what was your next agenda item? Well, it was, it it was actually the next agenda item was after him, I did keep something else which was the fact that we have a complete this has been a discovery in 2019 something very interesting which i found very very interesting there is a complete rec record of the program of your embryonic stage and your uh, fetal stage in your cells you've got a record and it is not just there it is carefully packed away and it is tagged it's tagged and it seems that this, this, uh, the, the people from Harvard, Dr. Sinclair, has been starting to talk about this now, because manipulating that program, which I think is what Dr. Levine's work is partially doing, he's busy manipulating this program that's packed away, is going to be the next big thing, the next big thing in, in, in anti-aging and in, 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 in medicine, in, in surgery. I just wanted to flash very quickly the, the relevant paper, if you don't mind, just quickly yeah. flash the paper. Um, let me just see which one was it. Um, oops. Sorry, people, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking for my, okay, let me just check if I can see the paper. Yes, I don't know if you... Can you see that? Yes. Are you able to see that? Is it's it all over the place? Sorry? Can you see the paper? Yes, it could be a yeah. little larger. Okay, no, I, I think, think Johnny, I, I'm, I'm using Linux tonight. I've had issues with my Windows uh, computer. So I'm using Linux. Um, so I think I'll just, just, just if you can't see it, the, the title is Extensive Recovery of Embryonic Enhancer and Gene Memory gene memory stored in hypermethylated enhanced DNA. The title doesn't quite uh, do justice to what they are describing because it's actually uh, earth shattering. Basically what they're saying is your embryonic program is still with you. It's still packed away in your genome as well as your fetal program because the, there's a difference between the embryonic program and the fetal program. Basically the embryo is formed in the first eight, uh, first, what's it? Uh, let, me, let me put it this way, the, the, the embryo is formed first uh, up to about the eighth week of pregnancy and then after that you're a fetus and the two stages uses a different sections of the genome to make you and what's fantastic is that the program that was used to make you 98% of it is still in your DNA carefully packed away and also tagged. So what people are starting to do is just sort of manipulate this program. And I think that's what Dr. Levine is doing. He's actually manipulating this program, which is why we see this perfect restarting of the growth of organs. 
So that's something I wanted. I have not, um, I didn't put it on our group because I wasn't sure how long the Dr. Levine would be. Uh, uh, maybe what we can have another discussion later on, but I thought I'd just throw this in here because this is also quite earth shattering. Um, the fact that the, that you can re rerun, you can rerun the development mental program because it is still in you. I don't know if there was any questions about that. That's a, a big breakthrough, an important thing to know, and one component I a, of I, I have a comment. Aging. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. The this is John Wenger. Um, so uh, I'm remembering, I th it might have been from my introductory uh, college zoology class, but there's a saying that uh, with regard to uh, development, and that I think was something like uh, ontogeny recapitulates, I don't know, wonder what, uh, no, phylogeny, no, what, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Phylogeny, uh, phylogeny yeah. Yeah. And, and the, uh, and, and this seems relevant. I mean, it seems like uh, what we're talking now, uh, what you just said is a slight elaboration uh, of that principle, uh, namely that uh, the whole genome is there for the different stages of development, starting from a uh, from an embryo to a fetus, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the uh, and and now people are trying to figure out how to how to replay parts of those things. Uh, the uh, uh, it, it's it's really handy that that all this uh, these genetic patterns uh, of development and our youth are preserved because as we get older we're our, our genome uh, our controlling active our current genome gets corrupted we think and so the idea of uh, uh, and people talk about taking your 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 genes and and doing gene banking. Or your DNA banking and that sort of thing. Uh, well, if it turns out that the the younger DNA is still in our system somewhere, a different piece of the of the total uh, genome, well, that's handy because then that gives you access to uh, a younger genome, and that obviously bears on the problem of uh, of aging reversal. Absolutely, yes, correct, absolutely. Which is exciting. Extremely, it's as if they uh, biology has handed us a gift. Yeah, well, it's not exactly that. It's, I mean, it's. I don't think biology. Uh, yeah, it's had, it, yeah, it, it is as if they've handed us a gift. But in in a sense, um, I mean, it's kind of interesting. It's always been there. We just need to open our eyes and look at it. Uh, that requires the right kind of eyes and the, you know the right kind of mind to be able to see that. Uh, but uh, but I really liked uh, Michael's uh, conception uh, because I really think that genetics has sort of taken over uh, biology and and I think he's right that the uh, uh, that that the that the real intelligence well not all of the not all of the uh, the, all the information is not in the genome. There's something about the what what Heb called cell assemblies. The notion of uh, where does intelligence come from, and the notion is that the, that that the neurons would organize into cell assemblies with various functions. And it's clear that different chunks of the of the body uh, have their own internal intelligence. That's why I asked the question about what would happen if you took uh, injected some eye cells and some hearing cells. Uh, I don't even know if, if Planaria can he hear, but but how would they determine whether to grow an eye or uh, an ear, sort of uh, Planaria ear, in the same place? Well, the, these organizational fields uh, would have to, in some sense, uh, either fight it out or uh, coexist, uh, and maybe they would segregate themselves voluntarily, and so you'd have an eye uh, in the tail and an ear in the tail, uh, not in the very same spot, but nearby not in the head, but back in the tail. And so I really think that, that, that he's really onto it. Uh, I mean, it, it's so, uh, it, it's just mind blowing. It's just such an important uh, discovery because uh, 
because there's so much information. That's why I was asking the question too about the optics. Uh, in one of his early, earlier slides, and Johnny, you did have this recorded. I really hope we can see this. Look, I'd like to look at his slides some more. Uh, there was an optogenetic uh, uh, term in one of his manipulations there, but it, it strikes me that there may be, uh, just as there are electrical ways, you know, he's, he's, he's manipulating with electrical fields, but there are other fields too. There are, you know, optical fields. And the, uh, it, the bigger picture might be the combined manipulation with electrical fields and optical fields, uh, because nature is very, uh, very clever uh, at using things in combination. I think that's one of the, the make, that's sort of the point of his talk. So I've kind of gone on for a little bit here, but I hope I've stimulated a few thoughts. I'm finding, I found that talk to be really uh, changing my perspective on the direction we've been going. It, it almost seems like, you know, our focus on drugs and even gene editing and CRISPR, we're still reprogramming the computer with a soldering iron. That's right. That's and absolutely right. Approach is no, we're going to, we're going to create software to, to change life. And it's, it's pretty uh, mind-boggling. I, I, I think the issue is not that we should be creating, we should be creating the software, we should be locating the software that's already in us and exploiting that software and giving it a chance to function in an older body as it functioned in a younger body. I, I think the software is already in us. If, if, the, if the genome contains, if our, if our genome contains the our, our fetal uh, plan and our, embryon, our embryonic plan, our fetal plan, et cetera, and our, and our, our, our you know, infant plan and the, and the child plan and the teenager plan and the adult plan, if it's all in there uh, for, the, for the cells, then it's also in there for the software. Why would it not be? If the genome contains all of that, then it probably also con contains the ability to read the associated software with it. That is to say the software is a property of of the of the ensemble of the cells yeah well i'd like to offer a thought uh, i am an electrical engineer by training i've worked with circuits and and also quite a bit with software it, and it, it, this it, is it, nothing like hardware and software this is something different i think we can at a conceptual level think about higher level controls but if you look at uh, all the mechanisms for synthesizing proteins for replication uh, that's not hardware or software you know and and bears a lot of thought uh, i mean there are some very high level long state machines in, in, in biology so how this whole field pattern you know Biological currents uh, communicates with that is very interesting, but I, I wouldn't oversimplify it with that comparison. Good. Yeah. Why do we? Uh, why do we can you can hear we, me now? Can yes. we get rid of the slides? Yes. Uh, in a moment, can can you can hear me now? Okay, because my expensive Yeti microphone cut off again, so I guess I'll have to reinstall the drivers or something. Robert had a really a great question that brings us back. So just how are we gonna use this to solve aging? Does anyone have any ideas? I was, I was dropping in the chat a few of my, my thoughts there too. Uh, yeah, yeah I, think with, I think with this approach, um, it just depends on how detailed your map is. I mean, if you, if you know with one uh, electric signal, electrical signal that it would have a certain physiological biological response and you had that across every type of signal and every type of response uh, you could start rejuvenating entire organs and in turn rejuvenating entire organ systems um so our yeah and actually the target the target that uh i'm most interested in is actually the um circulatory system right like your cardiovascular and then your musculatory organ system so it's really two and you really have to use it in combination with other therapies uh, because at the end of the day, like um, someone was alluding to, you know, you have some, you know, hardware, you have some hardware, whatever it is, but, you know, how do, how do the electrical signals detect 
um, you know, how do you, how do you actually target specific things? And it turns out that certain proteins in the body can actually, um, be like, think about like within like photosynthesis, for example, there's certain proteins in plants that are using light to do some kind of, uh, chemical reaction. And it turns out in the body, there's a similar thing. So, uh, you essentially have to use like a combination of, uh, peptides and other things with these frequencies uh, to be able to actually, you know, rejuvenate an entire organ. But that, that would be the approach that um, I would suggest. Very good. John Kramer had a question. Yeah, it seems to me that the um, problem uh, of applying this to aging is that really you need a map to decide which ion channels need to be opened and closed in order to produce given effects. There may be an, if, if we're lucky, there may be an ion channel that you can open that sort of causes the whole body to go into an anti age or, or age reversal situation. So this really needs to be studied in great detail. And I'm pleased to hear from, from what he said that there are a, a large number of drugs that are now being developed which ha have effects on ion channels. And so one needs to sort of cross correlate those drugs with the effects that they have in order to find out what's going on in mammals. And apparently very, <clears throat> planaria are, are fine, but they bear very little resemblance to us. And uh, so we, we really need a lot of experimentation, apparently investigation of what ion channels do what in mammals. Um, and if, if we can do that, we might make, make real progress towards dealing with aging. Excellent. Does, does anyone mic. here not know how to raise your hand with the little reactions? I the bottom? I was just trying to figure that out. <laughs> okay. And on the bottom, if you move your cursor to the bottom of your Zoom screen, it, it may be up already, it may pop up, but you will see mute, stop video, some other things. Now, farther to the right, to the right of the green share screen is reactions. If you hover over that, there is a raise hand. That puts you to the front on my screen. And okay, well, Good luck finding. Yeah, let, let's uh, right. let's do this. Miles had a question, then you. And does anyone else not know how to do that? There you go. There you go. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. I didn't hear that. So just so we can take everyone in order and everyone gets a turn, let's do it that way. Miles, please. Uh, thank you. Um, just to answer John, um, John, the John Kramer, the OSKM, um, the Yamanaka factors, they are combinatorial. And if you remember the experiments, uh, Professor Amanaka and all his collaborators tried many combinations until they hit the right combination, which was extremely, uh, uh, um, it was an extreme reaction from the, the, uh, the, uh, the embryo, the animal, because it went right back to the embryonic state, which was, it's, it's just radical. I mean, normally, normal animals just don't do this. So it was a needle in a haystack. And it was uh, not easy there to try many, many combinations. And I think the same thing is going to happen here. Something similar. He, he mentioned that he's got a cocktail already. I think that cocktail is fairly complex. And, and as you get higher up, mammals and so forth, I think that, com that cocktail is more complex than for the worms. So that, that's my, my, my comment on, on your comment. The, the other one, Fiona, um, I also studied electrical engineering and also chemical engineering. I did a master's in chemical engineering. What I think you, you, you know, the, 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 I, I discovered because I switched to chemical engineering, I found a whole host of what you would call design motifs. And I also call it design motifs. I mean, you're familiar with, say, a transistor. But as an electrical engineer, you are not normally familiar with a strange attractor inside the embryo. You're not familiar with the reaction diffusion equation, which determines that, that shape. You're not familiar with the other, the sort of other fields which have different engineering motifs, different designs. What Dr. Levine did, I think what you have to think about it in this way, living organisms are not, they're very uh, Catholic, they use everything. 
what it did, they combined electrical with chemical with mechanical in a very uh, 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 unorthodox way. But what Dr. Levine did, he took the electrical system by itself and discovered that that's a control system, which is, I think, very, very, very impressive. The, the chemical system is still very complex and a lot of it does not have electrical analogs. There are things that happen in biology which just don't translate into electrical uh, 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 motifs, but at least the, 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 the electrical control system is now in view, like he's manipulating it. He's not manipulating it with, with external uh, uh, fields. He's, he's actually using chemistry to manipulate it, but it's still, because you can measure it, he's got a voltage a voltage sensitive dye. So he's actually measuring the electrical fields and he can see, for example, like you said, he can see the face of the embryo before the embryo forms the face. So I think there's a lot of stuff yes, around there which is not electrical, which is very confusing sometimes. I, I was like that, uh, still am a lot, a lot of times, but at least we've took, taken the electrical system out and we found that it's a control system. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I, I know what you're saying. It's, it's enormously interesting. And I just don't want to oversimplify it. I don't think we fully understand, and Michael would agree, and I talked to him before. Uh, we, he doesn't fully understand, and he will not claim to. Uh, I mean, we're poking at things in, in the dark and trying to learn as a black box what we're doing here. And I would also not, I mean, I'm going to paste a link here for a video on replication and the whole thing that goes on. So it is a completely mind blowing too. And there is a, there's very complex, very long intelligent state machines and subroutines uh, that you will see there. And, and this is all new. A lot of it is new research. When I took biochemistry, even three years ago, some of this stuff was not yet known like histones. I mean, a lot of it is, is recent. Uh, and it's just mind boggling. And I, I just don't want to say, well, this is hardware because it has intelligence uh, of its own. And it, and it is isolated to a cell, right? Um, so in a way, you could say there's a hierarchy in what my, the way Michael is thinking is that you can control not at the cell level. You don't want to be controlling at the genetic level. And, I, and there's something very powerful there. Um, but I, you know, I, I just don't think we can oversimplify it that way. Well, there's a lot to figure out, but we need more time to do it. <laughs> Jeff? Well, you know, we, um, it, it, Dr. Levin seems to have really opened up a whole new field of endeavor, uh, <laughs> just scratching the surface. You can look at all kinds of applications to repair the damage of organs and systems in your, in, that, uh, that occur during aging. But ultimately, it seems like that approach is, you know, becomes a game of whack-a-mole where as you age, you more and more things go wrong and you can be repairing until that's all you're doing is repairing this and that. But because we are fundamentally programmed to age, but yet there might be an opportunity with this technology to change that program. We keep coming back to this computer analogy, but I think it's, it, it is a good analogy that if, you, if this technology could possibly just change the entire program where we do not you, you change the software so we do not age. Well, let's that's work on it. Let's do it. Shot. That's the moonshot, as you would say. <laughs> well, yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I've got something to talk about. You'll hear about it at a later meeting. But is, uh, let's see, Miles, did you, you had another question. Yeah, no, no, no. I just uh, wanted to say, yes, I, I agree with Jeff, but I, I do believe in this combinational, they're going to search for the right combination. And you're going to see the same radical change that you saw with the Amanaka factors, which is completely unnatural. So I, I expect that, Jeff. Um, but the other question, I was, uh, other comment I want to make is just that he's not alone anymore. There's a big program at Harvard University, you know, the nucleate program, the uh, vice, uh, the venture capitalist are doing a big program on bioelectricity, on bioelectric control. 
um, as, a, as a response to his discovery. So it's not, it's not, it's not as isolated as what we think. There's actually uh, money now going into this uh, technology as we speak. Yeah, I was just going to comment. Uh, I agree with what you said, Miles. It's a broad area of, uh, of research. And uh, commenting on uh, your comment too, Jeff. I think, uh, I think that you, you, I think you're thinking about it sort of the right, the right way to some degree, um, but with a slightly different flavor. You know, so it's not that we wouldn't age at all. It's just we would have various tools to enhance our resilience to effectively slow down the aging process very to like dramatically while also augmenting ourselves to be much more resilient um and then in turn actually reversing uh damage like it's slightly different like you think about like the sense um you know Aubrey de Grey they they always talk about like this damage but uh it's really like the repair mechanisms that are not functioning correctly or like the rejuvenation functions um, that aren't resilient enough. So I think we can augment those um, through through these tools would, would be kind of the way I was thinking of it. And another um, short comment, uh, you know, I was thinking about what Fiona was saying, and I looked at that, that video, and I tend to agree, there's so much complexity in the body. Um, but I think using like approach that uh, Dr. Levin's using sort of like a top down, you know, if we can target specific organs, uh, and we can see, I mean, the way he targeted like an arm to regrow in some of these sample organisms, you know, we may not understand some of the underlying biology uh, on the cellular level or even in the cells. It may be still remain a mystery even after we can rejuvenate entire organs. Um, you know, so I don't think we'll have to understand like every single component or even like the complete map I was describing. I don't think we would have, uh, at least not for a long time, you know okay, you have this frequency or this electrical signal, what does it do to each individual cell type, which, you know, we have thousands of cell types. So that would be um, a much harder problem too. So just a few thoughts. We don't have to understand everything to work with it. It's like, we may not understand how we breathe completely, but we breathe and we function. So in that way, I'm a complete supporter of, let's use that tool and all the other tools. Uh, I agree. Yeah, we have to have, a, we have to understand it enough to, to like alter it. Um, for sure. I definitely. <laughs> I'll take it. If, if there is a way you could, even if you don't understand, you could do an eye, you know, a pattern, a bioelectric pattern mm -hmm. and tell the body to go backwards and rejuvenate. That's cool. Right, it's it's a little bit of a um, well, we can we can certainly keep learning that dimension. Yeah, it's a star shot for sure, as Johnny would say. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's been a couple of hours. This has been most rewarding. As quickly as possible. I'll get the recording up on the YouTube channel. I don't know about you, but I'm gonna watch it a number of times for all this to really sink in and then take it to the next level. How will we use this to solve aging? And then, oh, little questions like, how will we raise the money to use this to save aging? And I have something I'm gonna reveal soon. You will probably be among the first to see it. So if you are going to the Foresight uh, Frontiers in Longevity Science, I think that's the name of the conference in San Francisco. I know, I, I believe Fiona, you'll be there. It's April 17th and 18th. You can't really get in now unless you become a sponsor, but yeah, that's gonna be, world class, so I'll look forward to seeing you there. One so other unless th there's any final, Jeff, final comments? Yeah. The, uh, if uh, people are interested in learning more about uh, Dr. Levin's work, it, you know, of course, reading all of his papers, but there are a number of much longer interviews on YouTube that he, and he doesn't just give the same canned speech over and over again. 
he covers a lot of different uh, uh, ground in his in his interviews that he that he gives. So there's some other uh, good videos to watch if you want to see more of him. Yeah. Just search for him on YouTube. Uh -huh. So this was uh, outstanding. Thank you, Jai, for organizing. It's no, 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 Miles. It was fascinating. I, I mean, I was at the edge of my seat. Miles, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Miles. Very good. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Appreciate it, Miles. Uh, thanks, thanks, people. Sorry for the date. Um, he, he was he's not available on Saturdays. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> me and Johnny had a lot of back and forth yeah. trying to get him on a Saturday, but we. <laughs> It's so well worth that. breaking the schedule for that. Sure. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much. Much yeah. worth it. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. This has been a great morning. We're all off to a great Friday and a great weekend. So thank you. See you next time.